This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Simon Phipps and I are joined by John Mad Dog Hall, the great Mad Dog, who both of us have known forever. We've been around forever. And we talk about everything. <laughs> I mean, just freaking everything. And uh, John knows so much and holds forth. And fortunately, this is the box office here. He and Simon get into it <laughs> over some topics. And if you want to hear that SmackDown, you got to stay on it. And that is coming up next. Our annual survey is almost through. One more week to get your feedback. Go to twit.tv slash survey22 to take it now. Uh, the survey runs out February 28th. It helps us understand you better so we can make better programming. So please, uh, it's voluntary, but we'd love it if you'd go to twit.tv slash survey22. And thanks in advance. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 669, recorded Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022. Free plus versus open. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by New Relic. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does. And you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of free data per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash floss. Hello again, everybody, everywhere and every time. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week, I am joined by Simon Phipps himself, who is less far on the other side of the earth than he was for me yesterday. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I, you I know, I've, I've still Indian. hardly moved. <laughs> I know. I moved three time zones. I shifted yeah. three time zones to the east, so I'm a little closer. I'm only five you know, hours behind you now. There's actually a big risk that I shall go to Mobile World Congress in Barcelona next week, which will be the first time oh, really? that I've left Southampton for any anything significant for nearly three years. So, and so you'll just jump one time zone there, even though you will hardly move yep. any further east, right? Because it's in Indiana in the U.S. is like that. It's like it really ought to be the central time zone, but it's not. Spain ought to be GMT. I'm sorry, it really should be, but it's not. <laughs> they, I think I there's know, historical Portugal. reasons for that, but I can't think what they are. Portugal is GMT, yes. Portugal is the same yeah. time zone as London. Yeah, and it's just, uh, it may just be that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a not Portugal time zone. I'm sure Spanish uh, or Portuguese listeners will fix us on that one. Um, so our um, actually speaking of Portuguese, I'm pretty sure I guess that I speak some. Um, it's a mad dog is on. Not to be confused with John Hall, there are lots of those. There's only one Mad Dog. So, um, and we both we've both know Mad Dog since what the last millennium, I think. At this uh, point. I oh, don't yes. know how long, honestly. It's ages and ages and ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I knew. I, I actually knew Mad Dog before he decided that he that Brazil was wonderful. Oh really? Oh that yeah. I yeah. Uh, me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, uh, and and I could go further into that, but I'd rather jump into the show because we have a little bit of a late start and start out by letting everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by New Relic. If you're a software engineer, you've been there. It's 9 p.m. You're finally unwinding from work. Your phone buzzes with an alert. Something's broken and your mind's already racing to what could be wrong. Is it the back end or the front end? Is it global? Is it in the server? Is it in the network? Is it the cloud provider? Do we have slow running queries? Did I introduce a bug in my last deploy? Now the whole team's scrambling from tool to tool and messaging person after person to find and fix the issue. According to a new Relic report, only half of all organizations are implementing observability for their networks and systems. The report showed how maintaining network observability continues to be an issue for companies around the world. That won't happen if you get New Relic. New Relic combines 16 different monitoring products that you'd normally buy separately so engineering teams can see across their entire software stack in one place. You'll get application monitoring, that's APM, 
unified monitoring for your apps and microservices. Kubernetes and Pixie, instant Kubernetes observability with Pixie. Distributed tracing, see all your traces without management headaches so you can find and fix issues fast. Network performance monitoring, stop guessing where performance issues start and ditch data silos for a system-wide correlated view. And so much more. More importantly, you can pinpoint issues down to the line of code so you know exactly why the problem happened and can resolve it quickly. That's why the dev and ops teams at DoorDash, GitHub, Epic Games, and more than 14,000 other companies use New Relic to debug and improve their software. Whether you run a cloud-native startup or a Fortune 500 company, it takes just five minutes to set up New Relic in your environment. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does, and you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash floss. That's N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C dot com slash floss. Newrelic.com slash floss. Okay, so I want to welcome to our virtual studio here the great, <laughs> the great, the great Mad Dog Hall. I, we were saying ahead there that Simon and I have known Mad Dog forever. Mad Dog is the, you know, I, I think in the in the firmament of the Linux skies, um, next to the the alpha star that is Linux himself, probably the one that shines brightest, or certainly among them, is. Um, is is Mad Dog? Um, Mad Dog's been programming uh, since the year I got out of college in 1969. We were talking about that earlier. He's worked in proprietary systems. He's worked in many many open systems. Um, uh, he's been around Linus himself since 1994. Has a strong connection with the family as well. He's worked with uh, Richard Stallman since '86. Before that, so he's been all over free and open source since the beginning. I think when I met Mad Dog, he was the head of the Linux Professional Institute or whatever its predecessor or successor is now. I'm not sure. He's been doing things in Brazil. We'll probably mention um, all kinds of stuff. So um, welcome, Mad Dog, to the show. <laughs> there he is in his head clamp, looking great and like himself. <laughs> How you doing, John? Mad Dog. I'm doing all fine, Doc. I that was a great introduction. I would have fluffed out everything <laughs> except the great part of great John Hall. Okay. I'm just a guy who happened to be at a certain place at a certain time. And we all? I happened to do the right thing. Anyway. Um, so, so I, I, I want to start out just by asking if it's true that you have 10,000 t-shirts. Is that, no, I, it's I not true. That, it's, it? No, it's it, not true. It's like, I have 15,000 t-shirts. <laughs> I thought it was only is it is only four uh four four figures. It's actually five figures of t-shirts. And are, are these in the like the t-shirt depository in Amherst, uh New Hampshire, or what? Uh, where, where is this? <laughs> uh, it's definitely in New Hampshire. Uh I am I am what people would call a hoarder. Okay. Wow. Only I don't I don't hoard newspapers that's stacked up to the ceiling and things like that. I hoard special things like I hoard beer steins. I have a large collection of beer steins. I hoard um, wind-up mechanical clocks, well, pendulum-driven particularly. I don't like balance wheels. I hoard, let's see, what else do I hoard? Well, you know, different types of computer stuff. Uh, I hire, I hoard um, just about every distribution of Linux I can get my hands on. And unfortunately, I've come to the point in my life where, where most people are known as downsizing. And I need to start downsizing this stuff. So I've been doing things like taking some of my t-shirts from my t-shirt collection, cutting them up, making them into a quilt. And then I gave the quilt to the uh, Ohio Linux Fest so that they could raffle it off to make some more money for their, for their festival. And the Linux Professional Institute, of which I'm the board chair, 
uh, paid for the manufacturing of the quilt and uh, and the transportation of the materials back and forth. And I I donated the actual T-shirt squares that make up this quilt. So I'm in the process now of trying to figure out who would like to have some of these things, which I which I have. And uh, I think that the best way of doing that is to raffle them off or make, give them to uh, Linux groups so they can raise money to help to keep their Linux advocacy alive. So you don't actually knit these yourself. These are, these are ones that you give to other people to run the knitting software that's going to put those things together because <laughs> the hand. Yes, hand it's, a, it's a, pretty it, labor intensive. It, it, yeah, it's it's a company called uh, Repat, I think, um, and what they do, yes, that's the that's the that's the quote right there. Oh and yeah. And what they wow. do is they you, I cut the squares into fourteen inch squares. It takes sixty four of them to make a king size quilt, and then they uh, put a backing on there, a very nice soft fleece in different colors. And I ship the, the, the 64 squares to them. They sew it all together and put the, put the fleece on and everything. And I can even specify where I want certain t-shirts to be put. So in the case of the Linux, uh, Ohio Linux Fest, I had some t-shirts in there that I had gotten actually from the Ohio Linux Fest. I had different t-shirts of different distributions. I had t-shirts in there from the Free Software Foundation. I had t-shirts in there from the Linux Foundation. And um, and that was, you know, there was there were some people that really liked that. And they, I, I think all together with the quilt and a bunch of other things that the Ohio Linux Fest made about $2,000 on their raffle, which you know, doesn't sound like a huge amount of money, but for, an organization that's strictly volunteer and, you know, they have certain costs and stuff that they have to do. It, it was helpful. So that's a little bit of, of what I'm doing right now. And of course, I'm still interested. I'm still working with uh, Caninos Lucas, a project down in Brazil uh, to design, manufacture and support a completely open uh computer system, much along the lines of a Raspberry Pi, except it's made out of two parts. It's made out of a, of a COM board uh, that, is, that holds the CPU, the GPU, and all the active components, and then an I.O. board that allows you to connect different things. And we're trying to stimulate some of the Brazilian economy there, as well as free it up from its dependency upon you know, other countries as well as generate the knowledge that it takes to actually do that type of work. So this is a conjunction. At first, it was a conjunction with the University of Sao Paulo. Now it's moved off to a not-for-profit called iTech. And um, we're, we, we've manufactured lots of these. Uh, one particular thing they went into was a very low-cost respirator that was also done at the University of Sao Paulo utilizing our little computer system. So this required the computer system to be certified by the medical board of Brazil in order to be put into the respirator and the respirator had to be certified as a medical device. Uh, the respirator sells for around a thousand dollars versus a 15 to thirty thousand dollar respirator that you might buy otherwise commercially. Uh, we manufactured about a thousand of those during the coronavirus uh, concept. So now we're moving out into other things, other areas uh, that we're working with the Canadian Solutions Project. So, what is the state of play of uh, the the software livre, uh, software freedom world down in Brazil now? Because I mean, back in the days when um, Lula was. Uh, had uh, a group of people who were promoting software livre as a as a, a concept within the government. Brazil looked like it was going to be the powerhouse of the future of software freedom, and that all seemed to get uh, kind of stifled uh, with Gilma uh, 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 and then with the current president. What's the state of play now? I haven't really been briefed for a long time. 
Uh, it wasn't so much Dilma, I think, that that, that stuck it. There, there was a couple things that happened. Uh, I think that certain large software companies that were located in Redmond, Washington, uh, became kind of, you know, interested in what was happening down in Brazil and put some really intensive pressure down there, uh, both on companies and, and state-run or organizations. Um, then when Dilma went out, they had more of a, how should we say this, conservative Republican style of government come in. And of course, we, we, we call those fascists in Europe. <laughs> I was, I'm, I wasn't going to, to say that type of thing. Okay. Um, I, I try and keep out of the politics of this. I, I, I like to separate politics from economics, which a lot of people don't seem to be able to understand. And the economics of free software is a lot of ways uh, allows a much more socialistic type of business or enterprise. And I understand that socialism is a very bad word in the United States. However, there are other countries that deal very well with that. And particularly when you talk about something called democratic socialism, which in the United States is often known as an employee owned cooperative. So instead of a bunch of people, a bunch of stockholders getting together, putting in a bunch of money uh, to, to, to facilitate an idea, and then they own the company, they, they call they decide what happens. They decide how much the employees get paid in a co an employee owned cooperative is the employees who own the company and the employees who figure out what the total overall or approve of what the total overall strategy of the company is going to be. And the employees then uh, hire, could hire, you know, people to run the company based upon what, where they wanted to go with this. So there, there are some very large cooperatives inside the United States. If you buy Land of Lake butter, uh, Land of Lake is actually a farmer's cooperative. And there are rural electrification companies that sell electricity, generate and sell, sell electricity that are customer owned cooperatives where the customers get a check back every year of the profits of the electric company. There are, you know, there's even a tech co-op company that's headquartered out of, of all places, Texas, that sells uh, in, uh, support for various types of uh, tech products and stuff like that. So there's, there's about 30,000 employee-owned cooperatives in the United States, and nobody ever hears about them because, well, just because. <laughs> um, I, th I think in a lot of ways, the, the free software movement is an employee owned cooperative is that the technical people, particularly in the early days, the technical people called the shots on what was going to be implemented, how it was going to be implemented. A lot of people think that Linus Torvalds was interested in a free of cost operating system. And Linus was never that way and still is not that way. In fact, using the GPL was kind of an afterthought for him. But he was interested and the rest of the kernel developers were interested in a really good operating system, a really good kernel. And it was the stress on the goodness part that, that drove them. Okay. Uh, I... I, I I remember arguments in the early days of the Linux kernel project of some of the kernel developers objecting to companies like Hewlett Packard or IBM or Dell, quote, making money off of code that I contribute. And we had that discussion back in those days. And we, we, tried, we pointed out to them that if you fought people making money off the software that you were writing, that the free software movement would move forward slowly like a glacier. 
But instead, if you embrace that and you wrote the software so that it was good for the things you needed it for and allowed other people to make money, that you would find out that it would move forward a lot faster. And there were some people who left the free software community because they didn't like that. But a lot of the best people, or I think the best people stayed, people like Linus Torvalds and uh, David Miller and, you know, Tridge and all the rest of them. They understood and they stayed. I mean, you write software because you need something. You're scratching your own itch. You enjoy doing it. You know, all these things. And some of these people were able to make it so that companies hired them and paid them to do their hobby full time. So, you know, today there's a lot more people in the free software space, or in the, I should say the, the open source space. And a lot of them just don't understand that concept. So well, that was isn't kind of that a, because... It, it, you know, it's, it's so so as we've drifted a long way from Bolsonaro and and uh, and uh, Brazil at this point. Uh, well, Bolsonaro doesn't because, understand it either. <laughs> yeah, they, I, but like, you know, I wouldn't expect him to. But I, I will. I will get into trouble if I say what I really think. Um, the, the, isn't the challenge here that uh, writing software to scratch your own itches is very elitist? Uh, if you are going to have uh, every citizen able to plot their own destiny with uh with soft with free software ultimately somebody is going to have to write software that isn't for them but is rather the leverage of their expertise in the domain that matters to somebody else surely i've heard a lot of people who are arguing um you know that that really it should be the geeks that are in control uh, it should be the programmers that call the shots but that that doesn't make um, an excellent word processor get written. Uh, ultimately, somebody has got to go and do some market research about what people who don't program want from a word processor and then hire people to write it. Uh, and so isn't, isn't that worldview that you're projecting there, Madog, uh, kind of um, a bit elitist, a, a bit, uh, a bit uh, last century? Uh, do, you, do you really think that that's the future of free software rather than the past? I think a lot of it depends on what level you're talking about, okay? Um, if you're talking about the operating system as a platform, you might find that there's a lot of uh, that, that, that there's a lot of commonality there that I would rather have somebody who has studied uh, the platform very much and is now uh, was to write a platform that is responsive, that has low latency, that is, uh, you know, highly available and all those things. I think that that's something where somebody who studied computer science uh, would do it. On the other hand, I'll go back to your, the, per, the people writing free soft, uh, ready to word processor, as an instance. I mean, I used to work for DEC and they had a, uh, a group that was writing deck office. They only had about four engineers writing deck office. And, you know, they would have, you know, none of those engineers really used a work processor that much. They, they wrote very few documents. They were, you know, very few presentations, certainly. And so they, they didn't really use the product. I think there's a lot of engineers out there who would both use the product and help to support the product or make incremental changes to the product because they are using it. That having been said, I would like to have more developers working on a project that actually use it. So when I talk to young people about doing free software, I say, First, find out what your passion is. Do you love music? Do you love video? Do you love gaming? Do you know what do you love? And then work on that project because now you're doing the thing, you're helping to make the thing which you love even better. 
And certainly you could work on that for a while. You say, well, I'm, I'm tired of, of, of working on this game and stuff. You know, I want to go off and work on something else. Then you can go off and work on another passion. And so, you know, you, you've got to have that mix of people in there. I certainly don't think that every person in the world is going to be a software developer. Uh, I, I would like to have more people in the world have written at least a simple program so that they understand that the computer is the stupidest thing on the face of the earth. Um, but just like I, I can't expect everybody's going to be a doctor, but I would love it if everybody in the world understood what a germ is and what a virus is and, you know, and, and, and how they're spread so that maybe we could, you know, cut out some of the things that people are talking about, such as, you know, tiny magnets inside of vaccines or tiny microchips inside of vaccines. And, um, you know, so it, it's that type of thing, I think. You know, I, I'm i trying to think of a way to pull this into um – something that's about the world that we have now and where uh, free and open source fits into it. And one of the things that strikes me is that because we're, we've all been, the three of us on this call have been around for a long time and we've been, we've, we've, we, you know, where, I mean, it would start, I mean, Linus said himself, you know, he, he did Linux just for fun, but both he and Andrew Morton, Andrew put it very emphatically when I spoke to him once, about how what kernel developers do is they want to make sure this works for everybody, whatever it is, your whatever patch you're coming in with. It's not just scratch, and none of them are scratching their own issues at this point. They're all working on the kernel to to make it work for everybody. But um, I think a condition that we have now, and I mean, when when Linux was new, and when personal computing was still new, and the internet was still new, even in the late late nineties. Um, not that many people are on the internet. Now everybody is. We're all living a digital life. We're all living digital lives. And and Linux and open source in many ways has won in the sense that it's becoming, it has become base infrastructure for much else. Uh, no company working seriously on software can ignore or not participate at some level, whether they're exploiting it or contributing to it, to open source development. Um, but where do we stand now with this? I mean, I I think there's a, a kind of call for responsibility, but there's also this weird thing where I think every, I mean, the, there are people like most of the young people I know are very expert in using their phones and very expert in using their computers, their gaming systems, or whatever, without having any knowledge of what the hell's going on inside there. <laughs> you know, they know how to make it work though. Kind of like anybody who knows how to drive a car now knows how to, you know, how an automatic transmission works, but there aren't many many shade tree mechanics left that know exactly what goes into internal combustion. So I'm wondering if you can connect some dots there and and look at where what's the responsibility of open source and free software now and development now in a world where we're all digital and we're all pickled in this stuff and most of us don't know how it works. Okay, so Doc, there's a lot of stuff you said there, and I'll try and, and hit. Uh, everything. Um, I'm going to try and, and go with the cars first. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the Model A Ford, very, very simple engine, you know, four cylinder, uh, very, you know, very simple carburetor used a mechanical braking system that was not hydraulic even. Um, and so when you opened up the hood of a Model A Ford, you could look down at it, you could see almost everything and, and imagine in your mind how it worked. Today, when you open up the hood of a car, you have no idea where any <laughs> where things are, you know, and the, the car has gotten much more complicated. There is no direct connection anymore between any of the pedals on the floor that you have. They're all just a rheostat that sends a message to a microprocessor that, that tells the fuel injector to inject more air or more gas or whatever. You know, the braking system is dynamic braking. There's no hydraulics to it, okay? So the, the thing, the world has become a lot more complex and it's a lot more computerized. 
way more computerized in the early days than we thought. He talked about the Linux kernel. And again, I'm going to go back to what a kernel actually does. It schedules tasks or threads. It's, it manages memory. It schedules I.O. devices, things like that. And that's basically what the kernel does. And in the Unix and Linux world, there was a lot of functionality that was thrown outside of what you might consider to be the kernel of an operating system and was pushed off into libraries. So if you take a look at the kernel interfaces of, say, I haven't done this for a while, so please, please forgive me for that. The kernel interfaces of, say, 1990, 1994, there was about 154 different system calls in that kernel. And they typically did things like open a file, close a file, you know, read to a file, write to a file. And I say file actually was blocks. And above that was a set of libraries that had 10,000 interfaces. And that was without X windows or motif or anything like that. You know, so a lot of the functionality, huge amount of functionality was in the libraries outside of that. And so getting the kernel right was more of, let's make sure that it's absolutely rock solid because if that kernel crashes, then your whole computer system crashes. If you lose an application, you curse a lot, you know, and you start the application back up. But, you know, or if a loadable device driver hangs up, you can maybe restart it without taking down the rest of the system. And there's also differences, of course, between a real-time kernel, which is controlling your nuclear power plant, and it's going to lower those rods when it starts to overload, and a gaming system where, you know, yes, you don't want your game to crash, but there isn't the, the damage done when the nuclear power plant explodes. So, you know, there's there's a whole range of things there. And I think that it's been amazing that the Linux kernel has gone to span of everything from driving the largest computers in the world, the fastest computers in the world, all the way down to you know, the watch that I'm wearing or the phone that I'm carrying. Of course, we have different interfaces, different sets of libraries. That's why Android is different than GNU Linux, okay? It's why there's an XOS and an iOS. But, you know, the, the, the kernel that's there scales very well. Now, there's a difference between open source and free software. And open source has been embraced by a large number of companies. They love open source. You know, companies that used to call Linux a virus now say, oh, open source is a wonderful thing and we contribute lots of code to the Linux kernel. Well, they do. But a lot of the code that they contribute to the Linux kernel is at that level that basically, yeah, it makes their products run better and it makes everybody else's products run better. But it's not a differentiator other than it gives capabilities to the Linux kernel that they needed for their business. And that's fine. But they are in control and they will deliver a binary only object in the places that they want to and they will lock people in. And there's lots of people that say, oh, yeah, I'm open source. And, you know, here's my open source code and stuff. But that's not the code they ship. They ship things with their secret sauce added. You can't take the code that they're pointing to that's open source and compile it, if you knew how to compile it, and make it work on your object. I have a whole drawer, in fact, two or three drawers full of hardware devices I can't use anymore because the company that made them went out of business and they never fully disclosed their source code. We are all familiar with a product called Windows XP. And when Windows, when, when Microsoft said, I'm dropping support for Windows XP, 
there was probably about five or six million or more people using, well, I know there's more than that, using Windows XP. If Windows XP had been free software and had followed the rules of the GPL, then Microsoft could have said, okay, you know, here's all the source code for it. Go ahead and use it. And, you know, the community of Windows XP users could have come together to maintain that operating system. But they didn't. And so eventually the Windows XP users were forced into perhaps buying new hardware to support Windows 7 or Windows 10 or Windows 11. Currently, there is estimated 0.6% uh, of all the desktop and laptop computers in the world still using Windows XP. And people say, oh, it's just 0.6%. That's not a huge amount. That's about 12 million. 12 million people still using Windows XP, still trying to use it. And if those 12 million people each paid a dollar a year to, to a company to maintain Windows XP, you know, that's a, a lot of companies, $12 million of revenue a year is pretty good. So, you know, the question is who benefits from open source versus free software? And I think the free software is, you know, the, the end user benefits from free software. That, that's one way of being more in control of your software. Simon, a, a few minutes ago, talked about, oh, you know, what happens if an end user wants to have a change done to their word processor? Okay. What if I want to have a change done to Microsoft Office? Well, I form, fill out a form and I send it to Microsoft. <laughs> you know, um, and the form is ignored, or it goes into a list of, you know, things that we might like to do in the future. Well, I used to maintain that list back at digital. We had about 20,000 items in that list. And I can guarantee you, we were never going to get to the bottom of it, which is probably where your requirement was. So, you know, so the person who wanted that particular fix or thing, they're stuck. They can't do anything. Compare that to free software. If I or a group of people that I work with or my company feel strongly enough about a feature or a bug that needs to be fixed, I could hire somebody to make that fix. I could pay them money. They could have access to the source code. They could make the change. They could submit it to the team, and the team could say, yes, that's a good fix, and we'll put it in. Or no, that's not a good fix. Well, th and this is why. Okay, if it's not a good fix, or if they're never going to put it in, then I could make a private copy of my of, of open office with my fix or my improvement. I could distribute that to anybody who needed it. And I can make my source code available to people who wanted to have that fix with that feature. But I can't do that with all of open source because I do not have control of it. And that's the big difference to me. Uh, I will also point out that many years ago, Certain large software companies in Redmond, Washington started showing up at open source conferences, like O'Reilly's open source conference. And they would show up and they would talk about how they were starting to embrace open source, or they would just talk about their products. And yet they never had any, they never invited anybody like me or Richard Stallman or other people who believed in free software to come to their user group conferences and talk about free software and the advantages of having access to the source code, the advantages of their customers having access to their source code. Um, it's true that Richard Stallman went to talk to the research division of Microsoft one time, but 
that was the research division of Microsoft. It wasn't Microsoft's end user base of large companies who might be interested or governments who might be interested. Microsoft has places throughout the world that if you want to take a look at their source code, you can go to this place and they will make you leave all of your pencils and papers and cameras and phones and stuff outside. You can come in and you can peruse over the internet their source code base to see if there are any trap doors or Trojan horses or things like that. And I know, I know about this because they have one of these in Brasilia. Um, the, the problem I have with that is how do you know that the source code you're looking at over the internet is actually the source code that built your product? You don't. You can't tell. And so it's all a sham. Microsoft knows that. It's just used as a checkoff box. So these are some of the differences that I've observed over the years of open source and free software. One of my biggest ones is education. When you use closed source to teach education, you teach the students how to use a closed source product to solve their problem. And you say, oh, this is how you design an electrical circuit using this closed source CAD system. But so, so the students learn one time from that. But if you use free software like LibreCAD, you can teach them not only how to solve their problem, but you can let them see how the software solves the problem. And if you let them see how the software solves the problem, you can even let them make the software better in solving their problem. And they can work with the software team that makes the product to solve the problem. So free software teaches three times and closed source software teaches only once. And why an educational institution would want to use, you know, closed source or even open source that is closed software is really beyond me. I know a lot of them will say, well, we want to teach this product because that's what the industry uses. We want to prepare the industry for getting out of university and going to work. Okay. Uh, you're telling me that you have an engineer, a, sci a scientist who can build a bridge or build a building and, you know, and do that work. They're smart enough to do that but they're too stupid to pick up a book about using an office product and learn it in a day. If you teach them, these are how office products work in general. So I'm not saying that you never teach them Microsoft Office, but you also teach them LibreOffice. You also teach them KOffice. You also expose them to the fact that there are more office products out there than just this one. And after you've done that, after you've taught them how to use an office product to make your business better, then you let them choose the product. Mm. So I, I, I do remember hearing that argument a great deal in the 1990s and, and in the last decade. Uh, I think that the, the, the thing that we've been discovering more recently is that, uh, the, I, and by the way, I, I dislike the dichotomy you're creating between open source and free software. Uh, I think that open source is simply what people who are not insiders call free software. Uh, the, oh, it really? Is perfectly, it, I, absolutely. It's perfectly possible for software that is under the GPL, or as we've just been discovering recently, the AGPL, to be used to take away people's freedom. Uh, just ask users of MongoDB, for example. Uh, they who have been baited and switched into software, which is now basically proprietary software with the AGPL as the, the bridge that got them on board before their freedom was finally removed. Uh, I never said GPL here, or AG, I never said GPL or AGPL. I said free software. Right. Well, f free, free software is great when you know to define it as software with the freedom left inside. But uh, wh when you are... Uh, an ordinary citizen who doesn't already know that, 
free software sounds an awful lot like something that's advertised during the Super Bowl. And uh, the, the, the phrase open source helps us to talk about free software in a way that makes it diff clear that we're diff talking about something different to proprietary software or closed source software. And so creating that dichotomy is, a, is something that I've heard other people are trying to do a lot during the previous two decades. I don't feel that that's where um, the, uh, the people younger than you or I, Madog, uh, are at with the phraseology anymore. Uh, I think that we are um, we, we are holdouts from a previous generation who insist on maintaining that dichotomy. The real dichotomy is between um, cloud computing companies that want to take away your freedom and use you as a subject in their uh, tracking network and uh, people who are in control of their own identity. The dichotomy is between software companies that want to tax you and rent seek from you, preferably through a web browser now, and uh, companies that want to help you use free open source software to remain independent. And I think we, we, because we haven't let the conversation move on from that dichotomy between open source and free software, there is nowhere, no one of your caliber or my caliber that is actually helping people find a way to be free anymore. Uh, and I wonder what we do about that, Madog. You know, we, if, we, if we're going to have this fight about free software versus open source, um, you know, I'll grow my beard back again. We can, ha we can, ha we can have the argument. Meanwhile, um, there is now no freedom box. Uh, there is now only a world where the box that you have in your hand is a box that tracks your every movement because we have failed to make sure that there is freedom in the phone. What do we do about this, Madog? We, we can't keep on rehearsing the old arguments, surely. Well, uh, you bring up a very interesting point, and that's the fact that free software may be taught in the computer science or, compu or the computer engineering lab, but it's not taught in the business courses. It's not taught in the political science courses any more than socialism is taught in economic courses. I mean, if socialism gets any gets any mark whatsoever in a United States economics course, it's somebody pointing towards Karl Marx, who's been dead for more than a century, okay, or or something like that, or or worse yet, they point towards Stalin, <laughs> okay. And they don't talk about the actual economics behind it, okay? So yeah, you know, we we worry we worry right now about um, oh crap, I'm having a mental blank on the term, but the 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 one that F, that the that the far right is pushing now about um, you know race theory, okay? Uh, yeah, CRT. CRT. We worry so much about that. When it's when when in a lot of ways it's non-existent, and particularly at the grade school level, but we don't talk about you know these other more important factors. So you know one of the things I'm I'm doing in Brazil is I'm saying to people, you know, here's how you can start a small company at literally uh, almost no cost. You don't have to go out and find an angel investor, uh, investor who at some point in the future may actually take control of your company because of economic factors. You don't have to do that. If you keep your costs low by using free software, open hardware, you know, and understanding the, the, the entire business model, then you can go a lot further. So that, you know, and I've had people come up to me and say, oh, Mad Dog, I listened to you talk about open software, free software. I did everything you said. And I, you know, I had an idea. I borrowed a lot of money. I went out and hired a bunch of engineers. I did the whole thing. And then what I did was I started to sell my product. My competitor copied it. And I lost everything I had. And I said, no, you didn't listen to what I said, because what I said to you in the very beginning is how, you know, do you have a business plan? What is your business plan? That was the very first thing I said. 
and you never created one to show how you were going to make money with a sustainable product if you did free software or even open source. Yeah. So, so that, that's, I, you know, I, I, I completely agree with you about that. And, you know, one of the things that we have that we did at OSI over the last two years was, um, uh, it was up on the screen a moment ago, we started a course at Brandeis University to teach people how to manage technology and uh, uh, include software freedom in their business planning, their business management. Uh, I think this is exactly where we need to be going. Uh, I think LPI has been doing a tremendous job of training the, 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 the technical folks. Uh, uh, we're trying to make sure that the business folks get trained as well. But I, I think you're completely right there. And that's what's at the root of all of the, the wicked things that are happening with people who are abusing AGPL and GPL licenses to, to actually take people's freedom away. It's that they're being driven by VCs and, and business models which don't respect your freedom. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I really think this is something that we're going to have to focus on over the coming decade, because I'm seeing more and more of people who are open washing or free washing, who are uh, using the language of free software and the language of open source to actually take your freedom away. And the thing that I'm most worried about, and I think Doc is very worried about as well, is that um, we're making no inroads at all into the, the, the tracking industry that tries to trade in people's identity and the tracking of their life to make money do you think that there's there's any any solutions to that that we can uh, get out there into the 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 thought space Maddox? well it's the thought space is really hard because you know every time you buy a microsoft license i don't know how much of that license actually goes to marketing microsoft but i think it's a fair amount when I was back at DEC, we had 36% as a cost of sales of everything we sold, okay? So 36% of what you paid went to marketing and sales in one way or the other of the thing which you were trying to buy. Now, one of the reasons why Microsoft wanted to bundle their operating system into every single PC that came out from every single vendor was that they could lower their cost of sales from 36% to 5%, okay? Because they basically didn't have to do anything to sell it. I mean, you bought a laptop or a desktop system, you got a Microsoft Office. You paid for it, and they didn't have to do anything, you know, except general types of marketing. And when you bought it and you fired it up, what was the first thing they did? Well, they marketed to you again because of the things that came up in your system. So you were paying for marketing, you were being marketed to at a very, very low cost. And when you take a look at free software companies like SUSE or Red Hat or any of the other ones that you know actually sell, trying to create a business out of it, the amount of money that they can generate for marketing is minuscule compared to that, even on a percentage basis. So that's a, that's a problem. And the, the, the problem that, you know, direct salespeople versus channels. Channels is also a very hard thing to do because it, it, as you sell things through channels, each layer of the channel has to take around a certain amount of the profits so that they can, you know, sustain themselves. So, you know, this is one problem that free software has, and even, even open source software has, that the amount of marketing money that can be generated by it is minimal. So what we have, you know, from my viewpoint, what we have to do is education. And we have to get the people that are already, uh, that already understand this to rise up and start going after their school boards, their, you know, their political people and say, hey, why are you spending all of this money when you could be having the equivalent type of software for free? When you could show your students, your people, how to make this software, how to maintain this software, you know, you, you know, why are you sending all of this money outside of your local place? 
when you could be redirecting that money to your local people who are then going to buy local food, local housing, and pay local taxes. Okay? So you make it back at the money thing. You make it back in the control thing. We always talk about software freedom. That's wrong. We should talk about software control. Who's in control? Are you in control of your data? Are you in control of your software? Are you in control of how long, you know, when you have to upgrade, when, you know, all these types of things? I mean, there's, there's, there are, there's a suit going on to Apple with a bunch of gaming companies to say, hey, I want to be able to charge using any type of money. No, no, not just Apple Pay. I want to be able to use credit cards. I want to be able to use Bitcoin. I want to be able, you know, this is a big thing. And Apple said, no, 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 no. You come to our platform. We decide how you pay because, oh, by the way, you know, you might be hurt if if you pay a different way. What? You know, does, does Best Buy say that? Does Best Buy say, oh, you know, you, 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 you can't sell anything, you know, just by using cash or by using the Best Buy card? No. They say, hey, any recognized credit card will accept. So, so we need to press back on this. Let's <laughs> talk. We, we've, we've pressed on the, on the clock to the point where um, I actually have to cut, cut off, not off, but I've cut out some of the closing questions we have. So I'd like to go actually straight into what are your favorite text editor and uh, scripting languages, even though you've answered this before. I'm sure as many times as you've been on here, which is probably several <laughs> in addition to the time I've had, had you on. All right. So my favorite text editor is VI. And the reason <laughs> I do that is because VI is so small, or Vim actually these days, it's so small that it fits almost any place. And, you know, it's fast. I go in because I don't spend huge amounts of times in a text editor. I don't. Okay. And I, I don't even know all the commands of Vim because they've been increasing and stuff like that. But I just don't, you know, I need to get in and out, you know, quickly. And if I'm going to do big things that with a text editor, I might, <laughs> people are going to go, what? I, I might actually go back to Sid. Okay, a stream editor and do you know, the same thing to gazillions of, of files at one time. In fact, it was it was because of cut and paste and said that I actually first understood the power of Unix. Uh, so VI and, and <laughs> a guy, if you like Emacs, great. If you like some other Pico or some other thing, that's fine. I really don't care. All right. And, no, and scripting go, language and, and for scripting language. It's still shell bash, you know, whatever yeah. you want, you know, I just, and I, and I do use that a lot. Okay. I'll go into my directory structure and I'll say, I'm going to, I'm going to find this file that has this thing, you know, da, 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 fine. Just do it. Just do it. Okay. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm working in one directory, I might use the directory you know, finder or something, a graphical thing. But if I'm going, you know, I have three terabytes of disk space on my laptop dock and it's almost full. Yeah. Well, so I if have... I want to go through that, if I want to go through that three yeah. terabytes, I'm not going to use it with some graphical thing. No, I'm sorry. I hate to admit how many, gra how many, <laughs> how many terabytes I've soaked up with all kinds of stuff. Listen, we've gone we've gone long here. It has been awesome having you on as always, and we'll have to have you back. You've been back more frequently than others now because you're the only one I've had back on the whole time I've had this the show a year, almost two years. So, been great talking to you, man. It's been you're great seeing you and Simon too. And, yeah. and Simon, I think I think we're actually on the same team. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we just need to, I know that you, you hate me to say this. We just need to fight harder, man. We just need to fight harder. I, I, you're on the same show, which to me makes, puts you on the same team. So thanks a lot. For being no, here. we, we totally are on the same team here. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we were when we, we've, we've, so we've both been on the same agenda down at Feast Lane, Brazil. 
And the reason yeah. for that is because we were we were both fighting for the same team then. And I, I think that uh, that the, the you know the great need today for uh, free software and open source is for us to work out together how to solve these problems that are sidelining free software and open source in the name of uh, of uh, global economics. And um, and I think we're on the same side for that. So sorry, Doc, I took over. That's okay. Global, yeah, it's okay. global <laughs> economics is why global economics is why we should be doing free software. See, we need to have the software. rerun, Doc. It's yeah, okay. So we'll. I, I like the idea of having an economic show, and so maybe when we have with that one, we'll we'll be back on it for you. Thanks again. Ooh, man, Doc. Do I have somebody that should be on that show? His name is Doctor Richard Wolf. Yeah. Okay, well, save it, and we'll talk after the show. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, man. Yep. So, Simon. <laughs> they got is to it, be rocking. Is it over yet, Doc? Yeah, I, I think I think that part's over. I think we're in the post show now. <laughs> okay. Maybe we're good, not. Good. Maybe we're still on the show. I don't know. Yeah, I we're can't tell. The so there you the there show. you go. Um, when you, when you get uh, formally bearded or still currently bearded, um, uh, free and open source software geeks together, that's what they talk about. Um, I, <laughs> I do I do think that the conversation has moved on quite a long way from where we all used to have that argument uh, in 2005. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, Madog is right that quite a lot of the fundamentals, like you know, Microsoft's uh, desktop productivity business, I don't think has um, has uh, had the Damascus Road experience that their Azure and cloud business has had. And I think that's that's a very fair judgment. And I think he's seeing exactly that happening in Brazil at the moment, the consequences of it. But I, I, I yeah. think we've, you know, the, the challenges we face from surveillance and um, uh, data yeah. aggregation and uh, centralized computing uh, all need some new They're things huge. as well now. So it they're huge. Another one is that um, I think both Microsoft and Amazon, and for, to a lesser degree, I suppose Google, other companies are actually making more and more money in their cloud services, their backend stuff, than they're making on the stuff that we associate with them, which are the you know retail in the case of Amazon and you know office software in the case of 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 Microsoft. There's just a there's a big shift there, and and that's tied in with the surveillance as well. Anyway, yep. um, this has been great. We have Daryl O'Donnell on next week. Um, I, I know him through the SSI world, a self-sovereign identity, but he may have other things to talk about. Good guy. And uh, I was just told his technical check was really good. So we're not going to lose his face. I hope on, this, on that one. So thanks, thanks a lot, Simon, for uh, being on the show and Mad Dog again for being here. And we'll see the rest of you next week. Did you spend a lot of money on your brand new smartphone and then you look at the pictures on Facebook and Instagram and you're like, what in the world happened to that photo? Yes, you have. I know it happens to all of us. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands on Photography, where I'm going to walk you through simple tips and tricks that are going to help make you get the most out of your smartphone camera or your DSLR or mirrorless, whatever you have. And those shots are going to look so much better. I promise you. So make sure you're tuning in to twit.tv slash hop for hands-on photography to find out more. <laughs>